The Mysterious Death of Pirate Barnaby Jack In 2010, the hacker world watched in awe as Barnaby Jack, a New Zealand cybersecurity expert, performed an act straight out of a heist movie. He made two ATMs spit cash on command, live on stage. This dramatic demonstration at the Black Hat Cybersecurity Conference instantly turned him into a legend. Jack was known as a white hat hacker, an ethical type who hunted down system weaknesses to help prevent cybercrime. But in his relentless pursuit of vulnerabilities, he ventured beyond ATMs and into far darker territory. In 2013, at the age of just 35, Jack was found dead in a San Francisco apartment by his girlfriend. It was reported that he had various drugs in his system. The specific circumstances of his death caught the hacker community's attention. Beyond the ATM jackpotting methods he'd demonstrated, Jack had become known for demonstrating methods of interfering with medical equipment. Susceptible devices included pacemakers, insulin pumps, and implanted defibrillators. Such methods in the wrong hands could easily be weaponized with devastating effect. Jack claimed, in a high-profile interview, that he could kill a man from 30 feet away by attacking a pacemaker. Jack had been scheduled to unveil another medical device hack with what he described as, quote, lethal consequences. After his death, many were concerned that he may have been targeted to prevent him from revealing the information and the name of the manufacturer of the penetrable device. Some have suggested that the U.S. government may even be responsible Certain subreddits and forums where discussions of this possibility were being had have since been taken down and banned. Upon hearing of Jack's untimely death, the general manager of Black Hat, the conference where Jack first illustrated his ATM jackpotting method, issued a statement, quote, The life and work of Barnaby Jack are legendary and irreplaceable. Jack's employer's statement said, quote, Lost but never forgotten, our beloved pirate Barnaby Jack has passed. Officially, Barnaby Jack's death was caused by an accidental overdose, but some still suspect foul play. I prefer lemons. In an age when we're more dependent on technology than ever before, a violation of our personal devices can be more than simply intrusive. It can be truly terrifying. One such incident reached an alarming climax when, in 2007, As Andrea McKay chopped limes in her home, she received a message from a restricted number, saying simply, quote, I prefer lemons. The strange incident was one of a series of harassing communications that began earlier that year, when 16-year-old Courtney Kuykendall and her family began to receive an onslaught of abusive and nonsensical messages. The messages came from an individual they came to call Restricted. Restricted communications contained threats of violent attacks, and worse, directed at the entire family, as well as their pets and school. One voice message said, quote, I know where you are. I know where you live. I'm going to kill you. Another said, quote, I'm warning you. Don't send them to school. If you do, say goodbye. They came at all hours of the day and night, and to the landline as well as their mobile phones, even changing phones Accounts and numbers didn't seem to help. On one unsettling occasion, while Courtney and another victim were explaining their torment to a police officer, their phones switched themselves on and called each other. The police followed the records and determined that it was Courtney's phone which had been sending the messages, apparently even while switched off. The phone was taken away, but the calls and messages continued to come. Conferring with phone network providers proved equally unhelpful. In total, three families were tormented by Restricted, including relatives and friends of Courtney's. Restricted even appeared to be able to see them inside their homes, as illustrated by the I Prefer Lemons message. Others referenced the clothes the victims were wearing at the time. A friend of the family's ringtone once changed itself to a low, guttural voice, simply repeating the command, Answer your phone. Some received voicemail messages, containing recordings of conversations they'd been a part of. Police investigations continued, and the FBI became involved, which found no earthly explanation as to how the messages were being sent, or how Restricted was able to see them, 
even after they covered the lenses of all devices in the home. Reports of restricted abuse stopped coming, but there's no official statement on whether the case was ever solved. Perhaps Restricted is an advanced, next-level hacker who simply lost interest. Perhaps it was all a hoax, conceived for attention. Or perhaps Restricted is still out there. What did Gareth Williams find? On August 23, 2010, Gareth Williams was found dead in a flat owned by the British Secret Service. He was a Welsh mathematician and analyst employed by GCHQ and MI6. The mysterious circumstances surrounding his death sparked a frenzy of speculation, which continues to this day. Williams was, by some measures, a genius. He achieved a first-class degree at age 17 and a PhD before being hired at GCHQ in 2001. He lived a solitary and private life and by all accounts was quite reclusive. After a few days of Williams not being in contact with his colleagues, police officers checked in on him at the Secret Service-owned apartment he was staying at. They discovered the remains of Gareth Williams inside a red sports bag that had been padlocked from the outside with the keys inside. It had been left in the bath for a week before it was found. The investigation that followed was controversial. Williams' family insisted that DNA evidence was interfered with and that fingerprints were removed as part of a cover-up effort. There was none of Williams' DNA on the padlock or edges of the bath, suggesting potential murder, although there were no signs of forced entry at the location. An official inquest eventually concluded that the death of Gareth Williams was, quote, unnatural and likely to have been criminally mediated. It was acknowledged that his work had been top secret and classified, and the details were kept from the public during the inquest. One journalist discovered that Williams had been part of a team of intelligence officers tasked with penetrating hacker circles in the UK and US. Some years later, in 2015, a former KGB agent now living in Britain claimed that the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service was responsible for killing Gareth Williams. Allegedly, Williams had rejected offers to become a double agent, and he knew the identity of a Russian spy who was working inside GCHQ. According to the ex-KGB informant, Williams had been killed, quote, by an untraceable poison introduced in his ear. Another theory suggested that Williams attacked sensitive documents concerning former U.S. President Bill Clinton, and that the FBI may have orchestrated the murder. Later, another investigation took place and concluded that the death may indeed have been accidental, although there are many who would treat this conclusion with skepticism. The true nature of Gareth Williams' death and the circumstances leading up to it remain a mystery. Gary McKinnon's UFO Files Gary McKinnon is a Scottish hacker who was accused by the U.S. of pulling off the, quote, biggest military computer hack of all time. McKinnon has confessed to carrying out the attack while searching for certain forms of evidence, but the question of what he discovered is the subject of debate. According to McKinnon, he was searching for evidence to back up certain fringe theories, suspecting cover-ups by U.S. officials. Specifically, McKinnon sought evidence that free energy solutions have been suppressed, that anti-gravity devices have been invented, and that UFO activity has been covered up. The U.S. military and NASA accused McKinnon of hacking into a total of 97 computers over a period of 13 months, using the pseudonym Solo. He allegedly shut down the entire U.S. Army's Military District of Washington network of more than 2,000 computers by deleting essential operating system files. He left a taunting message on the military's website that read simply, quote, Your security is crap. Following the September 11th attacks, McKinnon allegedly deleted weapons logs that resulted in an entire supply of munitions being frozen. The munitions were intended for the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet. In his defense, McKinnon accused the U.S. foreign policy of being, quote, akin to government-sponsored terrorism, and asserted that he, quote, will continue to disrupt at the highest levels. Officials sought to bring McKinnon to the U.S. to face trial and serve a sentence of up to 70 years. In response to this, numerous high-profile celebrities and musicians united to support McKinnon and assert that, at the very least, he should be tried in the U.K. 
McKinnon has confessed to unlawful access of computer systems in the U.S., but is viewed more as an activist than a terrorist. He describes his actions as part of a moral crusade, and claims that he did indeed discover evidence of UFO cover-ups. McKinnon claims to have seen images of a cigar-shaped UFO in flight above the Earth, and asserts that, quote, they will never tell us the truth. This description is consistent with other alleged UFO sightings. Ultimately, British government officials banned McKinnon's extradition to the U.S. on the grounds that he was searching for information that could have been beneficial to the public. Satoshi Nakamoto email hack. Satoshi Nakamoto is the pseudonym used by the individual or perhaps individuals who were responsible for the creation of Bitcoin. On September 8, 2014, Nakamoto's email was hacked, threatening to reveal his true identity. The email address was publicly known to be satoshin at gmx.com, which is the address used by Nakamoto to communicate with the Bitcoin community. It hadn't been used since 2010, when the mysterious Nakamoto went silent, just after Bitcoin became huge. Allegedly, the hacker had acquired Nakamoto's personal details and published a ransom note online. The hacker demanded 25 bitcoins to keep the secret, which was worth just $12,000 at the time. On the Ning message board, which Nakamoto had been known to use, another hacker left a chilling warning, quote, Dear Satoshi, your docs, passwords, and IP addresses are being sold on the dark net. You are not safe. You need to get out of where you are as soon as possible before these people harm you. Thank you for inventing Bitcoin. There have been several efforts to unmask the Bitcoin creator. Many have been refuted and denied. Most recently, a 2024 documentary called out an early Bitcoin developer named Peter Todd as being the true Nakamoto. This assertion is based on analyses of Todd's and Nakamoto's messages, the use of Canadian English, and other anecdotal evidence. Todd called the claims ludicrous and grasping at straws, and pointed out the filmmakers' associations with wild conspiracy theories. Nakamoto, as the first Bitcoin user, is rumored to have a stash of over 1 million Bitcoins, which would be worth $66 billion in 2024. His true identity is one of the greatest mysteries of the digital world. Which one of these hacks could uncover the biggest secrets? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.